Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We begin with the bombshell ruling from the Supreme Court on affirmative action that will transform how universities select students in this country and upend a key tool to ensure diversity on campus, which has been in place for nearly 50 years. Tonight, some are rejoicing while others are recoiling, calling the ruling a devastating blow to our education system. Here's what happened at the court today. All six conservative justices ruled the admissions program at Harvard and the University of North Carolina, which in part relied on race, violate the Constitution. In his majority opinion, Chief Justice John Roberts said the two schools' admissions policies involve racial stereotyping. The court's three liberal justices dissented, including impassioned words from Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson, who said, quote, deeming race irrelevant in law does not make it so in life. After the ruling, demonstrators took to the steps of the court to show their opposition. Harvard's incoming president is reacting tonight, saying the decision means the real possibility that opportunities will be foreclosed for new students. Tonight, we have you covered every step of the way. We're standing by to hear from people on both sides of this issue, including a group of students and a GOP presidential hopeful. But first, ABC News Live anchor Terry Moran leads us off tonight from the Supreme Court. Tonight, the end of an era in American law and American life. The Supreme Court in a 6-3 to three decision ending affirmative action in higher education as we know it. Chief Justice John Roberts joined by the court's five other conservatives declaring that the admissions policies at Harvard and the University of North Carolina violate the Constitution's guarantee of equal protection of the laws. Roberts writing that the school's affirmative action policies unavoidably employ race in a negative manner and involve racial stereotyping. Under the Constitution, Roberts added, eliminating racial discrimination means eliminating all of it. But the Chief Justice adding that some consideration of the racial background of an applicant is still lawful in applications' essays, for example. Roberts writing, Nothing in this opinion should be construed as prohibiting universities from considering an applicant's discussion of how race affected his or her life, be it through discrimination, inspiration, or otherwise, Roberts wrote. Still, he warned, the student must be treated based on his or her experiences as an individual, not on the basis of race. In a searing dissent, Justice Sonia Sotomayor, joined by the court's two other liberals, declaring, The devastating impact of this decision cannot be overstated. Ignoring racial inequality will not make it disappear. Sotomayor, who has written about how affirmative action programs helped her rise from a Bronx housing project to Princeton University and Yale Law School to the Supreme Court, adding, Equal educational opportunity is a prerequisite to achieving racial equality in our nation. Justice Clarence Thomas, who also acknowledges benefiting from affirmative action himself, but who has spent more than 30 years on the court trying to end it, striking a deeply personal note in his concurring opinion. While I am painfully aware of the social and economic ravages which have befallen my race and all who suffer discrimination, I hold out enduring hope that this country will live up to its principles, that all men are created equal, are equal citizens, and must be treated equally under the law. The Constitution, Thomas declared, is colorblind. Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson responding in a forceful dissent. With let them eat cake obliviousness, today the majority pulls the ripcord and announces colorblindness for all by legal fiat. But deeming race irrelevant in law does not make it so in life. The court's opinion exempts the U.S. military academies from today's ban on affirmative action in admissions, Chief Justice Roberts saying they present potentially distinct interests. That drew sharp sarcasm from Justice Jackson, who retorted, Racial diversity in higher education is only worth potentially preserving insofar as it might be needed to prepare black Americans and other underrepresented minorities for success in the bunker, not the boardroom. Over the course of 45 years since the court first approved the use of race as one factor in college admissions, affirmative action has reshaped life and learning on American campuses. Today, students were reckoning with what the Supreme Court has done. Alex Shea, who will go to Brown University this fall, telling us... It does make me feel a little bit uncomfortable knowing that in that admissions office, when they were deciding whether they were going to accept me, reject me, that they might have been considering my race. Because I, I think that that's not something that I can control or that anyone can control. And I think that it's unfair to judge someone based on that. And Duke University student Bumi Omaswari. My identity has to be my race. The, you know, the struggles that I've gone through, the trauma I've gone through as an African-American woman in the United States. If I were applying to college today, I would have to 
write about those traumas in my Common Up essay. I would have to write about those traumas and those very hard experiences for admissions officers to accept the overwhelming truth that we all know, which is that it is hard to be a black person in America. And I don't think that's fair. Far-reaching implications here. Terry Moran joins us now from the court. And Terry, certainly monumental change for college admissions, but what could this ruling mean for other areas in American life? A lot, Lindsay. Uh, today's landmark ruling will have consequences far beyond higher education. And while it does not directly impact employers, say, which are governed by a different statute, its reasoning is a roadmap to challenge diversity, equity, and inclusion programs at so many corporations. And conservative activists are already targeting the hiring practices, promotion programs, and internship programs at major employers like Morgan Stanley, Starbucks, and McDonald's. Lindsay? Yeah, so much can be impacted here. Terry Moran, our thanks to you. And we'll hear more from those students in just a few minutes. President Biden reacted to today's decision, speaking at the White House, to say that discrimination still exists and today's decision does not change that, and adding that, quote, this is not a normal court. Here's ABC's chief White House correspondent, Mary Bruce. President Biden blasting the Supreme Court, saying he strongly disagrees with today's decision. The truth is, we all know it, discrimination still exists in America. Discrimination still exists in America. Discrimination still exists in America. Today's decision does not change that. In a statement, former President Obama saying affirmative action allowed generations of students like Michelle and me to prove we belonged. Now it's up to all of us to give young people the opportunities they deserve. Michelle Obama insisting the policy helped offer new ladders of opportunity for those who throughout our history have too often been denied a chance to show how fast they can climb. Adding my heart breaks for any young person out there who's wondering what their future holds. But former President Trump, who appointed three Supreme Court justices and is currently leading the pack in the Republican primary, is now claiming credit for today's ruling, declaring this is a great day for America. People with extraordinary ability and everything else necessary for success, including future greatness for our country, are finally being rewarded. With conservatives in the court now holding a 6-3 supermajority, President Biden asked today if this is a rogue court. Is this a rogue court? This is not a normal court. Mary Bruce joins us now. Mary, President Biden is urging colleges to continue pushing for diversity in admissions. But is there anything more that his administration can do? Well, Lindsay, the president says that this decision cannot be the last word on this. But there really is only so much that the president can do here. What he can do is make this a central issue in the upcoming election to try and mobilize voters around this, using the court as an example of why elections really do have consequences. Lindsay. All right. Mary Bruce for us. Thanks so much, Mary. Thank you. A lot of Republican presidential hopefuls are happy with today's decision, including Vivek Ramaswamy, who joins us now in studio. Thank you so much for your time tonight. It's good to see you. All right, so I want to start out with uh, something that you posted on Twitter, uh, saying affirmative action is the single greatest form of institutional racism in America today. Why do you feel that way? I think by definition, there are institutions that regularly take race into account as a factor on whether or not someone gets a job or set whether or not someone gets a seat in college. By definition, that's institutionalized racism. And I think the Supreme Court made the right decision today to vote on the side of meritocracy over race-based preferences. I think that's a step forward, it's not a destination. As the next US president, if I'm elected, I would eliminate race-based affirmative action in every other sphere of American life as well including in the economy where it runs rampant today. So I want to just throw some numbers out there, right? The University of California system banned the use of race in admissions in 1996. In 1996, 7% of the students there were black. Today, that number is, is 2%. If you look at uh, University of Michigan, uh, before they passed similar uh, laws in 2006, uh, black enrollment was 7%. By 2021, it was just 4%. So we see clearly uh, what happens. There's a downward trend when it comes to diversity. Is that a good thing? Well, look, I think what's not a good thing is putting people into positions that they're actually not qualified to have. What this actually should wake us up to is the reality of the failures of early education, K through 12 education, starting at a young age. 
that's evidence of the fact that many poor Americans and black Americans do tend to be poorer than white Americans, for example, do not have access to good public education starting even in kindergarten or first grade. That's where we need to focus. I know that's not an easy solution. I know that everyone's looking for a Band-Aid, but a Band-Aid at the end of the process does not solve the failures early on. So we should worry less about diversity, visually speaking, and more about lifting up everyone to give them equality of opportunity. That's the way I'll lead the country. But how do you go about giving equality of opportunity when you're saying, basically, for some people, as you just said, there can be, uh, whether it's socioeconomic, whether it's by race, that we're saying, you know what, we're not going to even consider that um, in our admissions process. When you're talking about there have been decades, centuries, right, of, of discrimination that has caused uh, that disparity in our education system. So the reality is, and by the way, I went to public schools through eighth grade. It was racially diverse, majority black or something close to it. There wasn't a single one of those black kids that could not have achieved everything that I have in my life. I've lived the American dream. I'm now running for U.S. president. If they had also been given the same privilege that I had, which was two parents in the house and a focus on education. There's a crisis of fatherlessness, not just in the black community, but across America, across multiple races. There's good evidence that people are more likely to end up in poverty, more likely to drop out of high school. Let's address the family structure. Let's deliver school choice. I think that's something that actually does give a lot of Americans, including it's lifted up a lot of black Americans in the states that have adopted it, allowing families to choose to send their kids to the best possible school they can. That's how we deliver solutions. Uh, I want to read uh, 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 Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson's uh, very strong dissent, which I'm sure you've heard at this point, but she said, yeah. with the let them eat cake obliviousness today, the majority pulls the ripcord and announces color blindness for all by legal fiat, but deeming race irrelevant in law does not make it so in life. What's your reaction to her response? I understand the criticism. However, I think the right way to stop discrimination on the basis of race is to actually stop discriminating on the basis of race, to quote Justice Roberts from an earlier case in the affirmative action saga. I think that we have to at least start behaving in a way that puts meritocracy first. I believe that every child in this country can realize their maximal potential if they're given that equality of opportunity. And it is striking to me that the very opponents of this ruling today, the very proponents of affirmative action, are also some of the most rabid opponents of school choice. That's bad for teachers' unions, yes, but it is good for Americans, including those who grow up in impoverished circumstances. So I think there's a lot of hypocrisy to go around here. Okay, so last question for you, playing devil's advocate here a bit. If we can agree that diversity is better for all of us, whether it's in the classroom, whether it's in the conference room, but we can also agree that with this decision today, we're going to have less diversity, how do you... How do you uh, get from one to the other and say that this is a, a positive step for us when your answer sounds like you're saying, well, if you had two parents in the home, I mean, you can't have any kind of legislation that's going to put two parents in the home. Well, I think I'll actually push back on you on that. Right now, we're paying many single mothers more money not to have the man in the house than to have the man in the house. And affirmative action, as well as those policies, they were part of the same vision from Lyndon Johnson. You want to blame a white man for this? He's a good one to start. Passed the great society legislation, affirmative action into the law, actually the payment programs that I'm talking about. So instead of actually giving incentives that run against family formation, let's instead at least remove those government incentives. And to your point, yes, is there going to be a trade-off in the short run that's all else equal regrettable? Yes, there is. But is it in service of a deeper value of meritocracy? And we're going to solve that problem in a different way by starting with early childhood education and family formation. Vivek Ramaswamy, I really appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you. I appreciate it. Let's turn now to a differing perspective in support of using affirmative action in college admissions. We're joined now by author of Entertaining Race and University of Professor of African American and Diaspora Studies at Vanderbilt University, Mr. Michael Eric Dyson. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. So you just heard uh, Vivek's take there, uh, your reaction. Yeah, um, he's a bright guy. I'm sure he's well intending, but he is philosophically flawed. At the fundamental root of his argument is a serious contradiction. He keeps speaking about merit as if merit is an abstract conception that is absolute in all situations uh, for all time. If I'm in a boxing ring, striking somebody in front of me is meritorious. If I'm in a home, 
it is either child abuse or domestic abuse. The act itself is the same. The intent um, and the consequence are determinative of what is meritorious. So when we talk about race as a merit, race is a merit because race has been used against African-American and other minoritized and racialized groups in America for so long. Race must now be a consideration in defense of and to the advantage of those African-American people. The Supreme Court in 1857 said, the black person, the Negro, has no rights that a white person is bound to respect. That is deeply entrenched in law. Was that a meritorious argument? The, the, the Supreme Court made an argument that fundamentally deprived African-American people of their rights. We can't address the need to deal with the remuneration, the re reparation, the reconciliation of black people to a just future without taking race into account. You know, uh, I've, I've heard a lot of critics say, well, you know, that was then, you know, slavery was so long ago. How much longer are we supposed to have these uh, set apart programs uh, for black people? I mean, as you just heard Vivek say that that all the black students who went to his public school, they had the same opportunities uh, that he did. Well, look, how many Lindsay Davises are there? How many Michael Eric Dysons are there? How many Kim Godwins are there? How many people running Fortune 500 corporations? How many people have been president of the United States of America? How many have been Senate, senator? On and on and on. What about the housing crisis that continues to besiege uh, American communities, especially African Americans? So when we look at every index of achievement, uh, what the basic value of a black family is versus a white family, that is not caused by laziness. That is not caused by the lack of, um, if you will, elbow grease. That is caused by systemic, systemic barriers that to this day persist in the face of ongoing attempts to render uh, the American scene far more just. So we ain't talking about something way back in the day. We're talking about what's going on right now before our faces. Uh, you've certainly been critical of Justice Clarence Thomas, who's been a supporter of ending affirmative action. And he wrote a rare concurring opinion, uh, calling our Constitution colorblind and saying, while I am painfully aware of the social and economic ravages which have befallen my race and all who suffer discrimination, I hold out enduring hope that this country will live up to its principles so clearly enunciated in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States that all men are created equal, all uh, are equal citizens and must be treated equally under the law. Uh, your reaction to that? Trust but verify. I have a hope as well that America will one day reach its goal. Martin Luther King Jr. articulated that dream in 1963, and he went right from that gathering to try to make certain that American democracy would be realized. He was fighting in Birmingham where four girls were blown to their heavenly reward. He faced uh, economic inequality in the Watts and in Chicago. So here is a man who had the greatest hope that America could achieve those goals, but without the elbow grease, without the effort, without the systemic inequities being resolved, without addressing race head on, none of what uh, Clarence Thomas has suggested can possibly come into play. It, the case does mention other factors used in admissions at Harvard, including legacy status, recruited athletes, and financial eligibility. Do you think it's fair to keep those in place while taking out race? Absolutely not. Think about Ira Katz Nelson, who wrote the book, When Affirmative Action Was White. Let me let people settle in. When Affirmative Action Was White. What was he speaking about? The GI Bill. What did the GI Bill give white America? First of all, it created a white middle class and basically created white suburbia. What did it do? It gave people points on a test to get into school and money to attend. What did it do? It gave them uh, money for housing because Owning a house was an elevator or at least an escalator into the middle class. What did it do? It gave them employment opportunities to be able to get a job. That's the holy trinity of affirmative action. When it is applied to white Americans, it seems to be non-controversial. When applied to African-American people, not so much. But race has been a demerit for so long, race must now constitute a merit when addressing the issues of the persistence of racial inequality in America. Michael Eric Dyson, always a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you so much. Always great to be on. Thank you for having me.
Now to the air quality and heat alerts for about 230 million Americans right at the beginning of the July 4th holiday weekend. The haze from Canadian wildfires reached New York City once again. In Philadelphia, code red is in effect. And Washington, D.C. now has the worst air among the world's major cities. And tonight, that record heat in the south is spreading north and east after taking at least 14 lives in Texas and Louisiana. Here's ABC's Alex Perez. Tonight, major city skylines disappearing into a shroud of smoke from those unending Canadian wildfires. This time lapse showing what Cleveland looked like this morning. This smoke is just making me sick. Columbus, Ohio, recording its worst air reading ever, 244 on that scale of 1 to 500 at 7 a.m. The air quality index much higher. In Pittsburgh, the Pirates delaying today's game against the San Diego Padres. Detroit and Washington, D.C. taking the top spots for the worst air quality in the world. Officials in D.C. and Philadelphia issuing a code red. It makes me feel nauseous, and I can feel the particles in the air. Last night, I even felt my eyes were watering. The entire state of New York is under hazardous conditions with respect to our air quality. New York's governor announcing a plan to send text alerts to residents' phones when air quality is dangerous. Meanwhile, that record-breaking high-pressure heat dome parked over much of the south is spreading from Texas to Florida. At least 14 deaths confirmed in Texas and Louisiana. A delivery driver nearly collapsing on a front porch in Cypress, Texas. Amazon says they reached out to the driver after seeing this, and the driver is okay. That heat fueling these fires burning near Phoenix and even helping spawn severe weather. These powerful storms south of Chicago and this massive tornado overnight in Nebraska. And Lindsay, some rain here in Chicago and a change in wind pattern is expected to give those impacted areas a break from the smoke as we head into the weekend. But those Canadian wildfires are expected to burn all summer, so we will not be fully in the clear anytime soon. Lindsay? Alex Perez, thank you. Also on the move tonight, severe storms. ABC senior meteorologist Rob Marciano is tracking it all for us. Hey, Rob. Hi, Lindsay. We had that derecho that began early this morning. We had winds gusting to 70 and 80 miles an hour in Kansas and Missouri. That meets one of the requirements for a derecho, which is basically a cluster of damaging storms that has to go at least 400 miles and be 60 miles across. You see this one start just around Lincoln, Nebraska, and then blast through Little Rock or St. Louis and parts of Illinois down through Indiana. Now it's into parts of Kentucky. This was over 600 miles long, and we can still have leftover severe thunderstorm watches in that area. Also, tornado watch up that includes Denver for the next several hours and more severe thunderstorms, including the potential for tornadoes from Denver, arcing all the way to Nashville tomorrow. That's around that heat dome that's brought dangerous heat to Texas. We'll slide a lot further to the east tomorrow, and that will bring dangerous heat to places like Little Rock and Nashville and Atlanta. These temperatures, in some cases, over 100, measured in the shade. Certainly dangerous stuff. Lindsay? All right. Rob Marciano for us. Thanks so much, Rob. New fallout after the Wagner Group's rebellion. Sergei Sorovikin, one of Vladimir Putin's top generals who reportedly had been having conversations with Wagner Group leader Yevgeny Prigozhin, has apparently been detained, according to a U.S. official. At the same time, former Vice President Mike Pence made a surprise visit to Ukraine, meeting with President Zelensky. Pence becomes the first Republican candidate for president to make that trip. The clashes have continued tonight in France after the police shooting of a 17-year-old during a traffic stop near Paris. Protesters have been torching cars and buildings as they demand accountability for the shooting. Curfews are in place in several cities. And officials say at least 100 people have already been arrested tonight after 150 arrests last night. The teen's mother has called for the marches to continue, while French President Emmanuel Macron urges calm. The officer involved is now in custody. A former sheriff deputy was acquitted on all charges for his alleged failure to act during the Parkland school massacre. Scott Peterson wept in a Florida court as he heard the verdict while the family members of some of the victims shook their heads in disbelief. Peterson was the school's resource officer and stayed outside of the building while the shooting took place. 17 people were killed that day at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. A grand jury in Texas decided against criminal charges for rapper Travis Scott and other concert organizers in the deadly Astroworld crowd crush. Ten concert goers, including a nine-year-old boy, were killed when the audience rushed the stage during Scott's performance at NRG Park in Houston in 2021. The artist has since said that he was unaware of what was happening. His attorney called the decision a great relief to Travis 
Scott is still facing civil litigation. Still much more to get to here on Prime tonight. Coming up, the new details about that Chinese spy balloon that flew over the U.S. What officials have discovered about the technology it used? Plus, a man is seen on camera throwing a lit firework at a crowd. Why this is now being investigated as a possible hate crime. Whenever news breaks, the crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. NBC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. So much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. But a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Welcome back, everyone. In today's Prime Focus, we're talking to the people who are most affected by today's ruling students. Bumio Misere is a student at Duke University, and Alex Shea will be attending Brown University in the fall. Thank you both for coming on the show. Bumi, I'd like to start with you. What's your reaction to today's ruling? I can't say that I'm surprised, given the current uh, Supreme Court that we have, but I do worry about what getting rid of affirmative action means for the diversity that we see on campuses, especially schools like Duke University and Brown. Um, people that look like me who are underrepresented minorities typically don't find themselves in these universities. And I'm afraid that that's gonna be a trend we see continuing in the years to come. Alex, you have a different take. Uh, what are your thoughts? I think this ruling is a win for America. I think that America fundamentally, one of our core tenets, which is in our Constitution, in our 14th Amendment, is that we don't treat people differently based on what race they are. And that's essentially what this Supreme Court decision says, is that colleges cannot treat students differently based on the race. And I think that's the right call. I think that's fair, because I, I, I genuinely don't understand why um, a student's race should be a factor in the admissions process, because I think that there are so many better characteristics that we can use to judge students. Alex, I want to push back for a moment there, because you said we don't treat people differently based on their race. Do you think that that's the reality in America today? Do you think that people get all treated the same despite their race? Well, I think that obviously there are disadvantages that some people face. And I think I heard the president's speech earlier today, and he was talking about how still, even though this ruling happened, colleges can still consider a student's economic background, the school district that they went to. And I think absolutely those th are things that we should consider, because you're absolutely right that in the past there has been systemic racism, which has held minorities back. And so I think as a result of that, we should absolutely be considering a student's circumstances and how best they were able to capitalize lives on the opportunities that were accessible to them. And I think that absolutely is appropriate. Just one more question, and it's a yes or no here. Uh, you said in the past there's been systemic racism. Is that to imply that it does not exist today? Well, I think it depends. I think that affirmative action is, in a sense, systemic racism and that we're treating students differently based on race. 
Uh, Boomi, for students whose education was impacted by racial inequities, uh, they might now have to write about their experiences in their essays because they aren't allowed to reveal race on the application. How do you think that that'll impact future college applicants? I would say that it's going to add another layer to the systemic racism that I believe is very, very alive and well in America and in college admissions, it's no different. When we think about underrepresented minorities, black and Latino students in particular, I think that by forcing these students, if they wish to have their race considered, to write about these racial challenges, traumas, and discrimination is making their race the forefront of their identity, which is not fair to these students. And I would also say that the there are many, many different factors that what a student cannot control that are still being considered in college admissions. Let me just want you to react directly to, to what Alex had to say because he said he doesn't think that uh, we should treat people differently based on their race when it comes to, well, in general, but also in particular here when it comes to college admissions. Well, I would say that I think many people who have been the victims of systemic racism, like myself, would be very, very clear in stating that race and racism is still very, very alive today. And I think that by this ruling, we're going to see more people who look like me um, unable to get into these schools, not because they aren't good enough to get in, but because these campuses may not be able to maintain their diversity initiatives as well as they could have when affirmative action was still allowed. Even just the idea that it cannot be marked on your application, but it can be deeply and very descriptively written about in your essays makes no sense to me. If we're allowing students to talk about their race, then why can we not allow these students to check a box about their race when they're applying? Both of you applied and were accepted to universities that did consider race as a factor in their admissions. I'm curious about how that consideration makes you feel. Alex, we'll start with you. Right. Well, I think obviously I'm a little bit uncomfortable knowing that I got into Brown and that somehow or another my race was a factor. I, I think that personally I want them to judge me for Alex, my individual, my individuality, and I want to be able to portray myself authentically. And I, I wasn't able to do that. Bumi, your thoughts? I would say that I am glad that in a holistic admissions process, my identity and part of that is my blackness, the first thing that people see when they see me was included in my application. And, you know, the thing about affirmative action as we've known it, as um, Alex and I actually went through is that by virtue of Supreme Court precedent, it was only to be considered amongst a host of other factors. And so I just feel sad for my underclassmen that are still in high school who won't get to be known by that all-encompassing part of their identity, which, whether we like it or not, in America, race is part of your identity. It's not something that you can separate yourself from. Bumi and Alex, really appreciate this academic discussion. No doubt it's going to be going on in classrooms and homes uh, for weeks and possibly years to come. And, and we appreciate both of your, your insights and, and both of your perspectives tonight. Still much more to get to. Coming up, four NFL players are facing substantial suspensions, including possibly being benched for the entire 2023 20, season, and perhaps even longer, what they're accused of doing. From brands refusing to dress hip-hop artists to luxury fashion houses embracing their style, we take a look at the cultural impact of the genre as we mark 50 years of hip-hop. But next, in the wake of the Supreme Court banning the use of affirmative action in college admissions, we're taking a closer look at what it could mean for diversity on campuses by the numbers. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. I came out of jail with a plan. 
I was gonna put every piece of energy I had into music. Give it up for Jelly Roll! If I wasn't a musician, I'd be dead. This was my best bet to really have an impact. <laughs> I'll cry with you. Who would have thought I could help people? I needed help, you know? I still need help. Somebody say me. I love you. With so much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. Been a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. You never know what you're going to get on this show. That's all I'm going to tell you. Yes, Whoopi! This mic on? Can you hear me out there? Behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely. Always. Absolutely. That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right. They don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasured that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby. It was crazy. Behind the table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings, a new podcast from ABC Audio. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. This is where the newsmakers come first in the morning to be heard. America's number one morning show. How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? Wherever the story, ABC's Good Morning America is right there. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey, I'm David Muir. Wherever the story, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back, everyone. As we dig deeper into today's Supreme Court ban on the use of affirmative action in college admissions, we wanted to see what it might mean for diversity on campuses across the country. And here's what we found by the numbers. We can get some idea of what college enrollment may look like without affirmative action by looking at the nine states where it's already banned. California voted to drop affirmative action more than 25 years ago. Within two years, black and Hispanic enrollment at the University of California system dropped by half. Back then, 7% of UCLA student body was black. Today, it's a 2%. That, despite the fact that the school has spent half a billion dollars trying to boost numbers. Before Michigan passed a ban in 2006, black enrollment at the University of Michigan was 7%. By 2021, it was 4%. The school has tried to focus on special preference for socioeconomic status, but that has not proven a perfect proxy for race. And at the University of Washington, minority students made up 7% of the entering class the year that the state passed a ban, down from from 8.2% just the year before. Educators say less diverse campuses will hurt all students. A 2019 study by the American Council on Education found that racial and ethnic diversity at school and in the office leads to greater productivity, innovation, and cultural competency. And we still have much more ahead here on Prime. The damage left behind after flames race through a renowned jewelry company's flagship store here in New York City. And what a night. The decisions that led one pitcher to a major accomplishment, the perfect game. What does it take to be America's number one news? It takes asking the straightforward, tough questions. Do you believe that Donald Trump should ever be president again? How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? The newsmaking interviews. You said that there were six friends. One of them was sick. Yeah. Do you have future political aspirations? 
going to the front line. The search for survivors. How does this war end? And getting to the heart of the story. Thank you for being here. We'll be here for the long run. ABC News, number one in the morning. The number one newscast. Number one in daytime talk. Friday nights, Sunday mornings versus the competition. And the number one streaming news. Thank you for making ABC News America's trusted, straightforward, first choice. With so much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. With a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families Trump. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings, a new podcast from ABC Audio. Listen now, wherever you get your podcasts. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. New details about the Chinese spy balloon that flew over the U.S. Several NFL players are facing long suspensions, and they say nothing is perfect, but one pitcher just had the perfect night. These stories are much more in tonight's rundown. Preliminary findings show the Chinese spy balloon that flew over the U.S. earlier this year was heavily equipped with American-made technology. According to the Wall Street Journal, the early stages of an investigation show that American tech helped the balloon collect photos, videos, and other information. It reportedly had satellite-like sensors and solar panels with radar capabilities. California police looking for a suspect who threw lit fireworks into a crowd during a Pride event. Hermosa Beach police released video of the incident, which happened at a silent disco June 17th. It shows a suspect off to the side, lighting the firework and throwing it into the crowd before fleeing. Police said fragments hit multiple people, but there were no life-threatening injuries. They're investigating the incident as a possible hate crime. The NFL announced that four players were suspended for gambling violations. Isaiah Rogers and Rashad Berry of the Indianapolis Colts and free agent Demetrius Taylor were suspended indefinitely through at least the upcoming season for betting on NFL games last season. The league also suspended Nicholas Petit Frere of the Tennessee Titans for six games for gambling on other sports at the club facility. The Colts subsequently said they had waived Rogers and Berry from the team because of the violations. A fire at Tiffany & Company's flagship New York City store. New York Fire Department says an underground transformer caught fire under that iconic store this morning. Gray smoke engulfed the building. Officials say two people suffered minor injuries. And they evacuated nearly 100 from the building. Investigators say no smoke made it into the store, which held a grand opening in April after renovations. 
Fans congratulating celebrities who've announced surprise baby news. Model Naomi Campbell telling Instagram followers she has welcomed a second child. Campbell is 53 years old, also has a two-year-old daughter, and says it was never too late to become a mother. Her announcement follows Chrissy Teigen's news Wednesday that she and her husband John Legend had welcomed their fourth child. Teigen on Instagram saying their son Ren was born via surrogate on June 19th, just a few months after Teigen gave birth to their daughter Esty. History on the baseball diamond. Grounded to third. Yankees pitcher Domingo Herman completing a perfect game against the Oakland Athletics last night, not allowing a single base runner in his team's 11-0 win. It's the 24th perfect game in MLB history and the first since 2012. Herman dedicated the game to his late uncle who passed away days earlier. He would have been so happy. You know, he was always um, someone that uh, really brought a joy to our family. It happened for him to watch it this way from up there. We want to take one more look at today's big news out of the Supreme Court this hour. For that, we turn to ABC's Devin Dwyer. And Devin, we're certainly hearing a lot of debate about the court's ban on affirmative action today, as is to be expected. Where does popular opinion stand on this issue? You know, Lindsay, as historic and controversial as this opinion today was, it's actually in line with public opinion. Majorities of Americans, including majorities of black, Hispanic, and Asian Americans in some polls, say uh, they would support this decision of the Supreme Court ending affirmative action. And overwhelmingly, when the Pew Research Center took a look at what Americans think should be looked at in, in assessing college applications, they said grades and test scores uh, should matter the most. They also said in a Pew Research Center study asked last Last year uh, about whether like, race or legacy factors should be considered. They reject those ideas on uh, of application. So Americans really behind what the, Su the Supreme Court uh, did and said today, Lindsay. And while we've been focused on the affirmative action ruling, the Supreme Court handed down another important decision today as well. Tell us about that. Yeah, a unanimous decision, Lindsay, in a case that will impact every American workplace. This was uh, a, a big question of how accommodating bosses have to be uh, of employees' religious practices. The question on the table uh, involved a postal service worker from Pennsylvania named Gerald Groff. He was disciplined for skipping Sunday shifts, uh, delivering Amazon packages. He wanted to observe the Sabbath. He resigned and sued. And today, the Supreme Court took his side. The court said they would be raised the bar for when employers can refuse to accommodate your religious observance. Justice Samuel Alito saying that companies now have to suffer a substantial cost to their business in order to deny your, uh, an employee's request to, say, take a day off or do something while on the job. And Gerald Groff, who we caught up with this afternoon, told us he's elated. Take a listen. I'm thrilled. I'm especially, you know, excited about the fact that it was a 9-0 decision in, in our favor because that just means that all of the Justices are, are in agreement that uh, the decision is right and is, is supporting or protecting religious freedom is what America needs. He went on to tell me, Lindsay, that he's unsure whether he's going to try to get his job back at the Postal Service. But the bottom line in this other significant case that came out uh, today is that employers will have to be more accommodating of religious practices in the workplace, Lindsay. And today, Chief Justice Roberts said that tomorrow, Friday, would be the last day of the term. There are still more rulings to come. What else are we watching out for? Two more big cases will come down from the Supreme Court tomorrow, Lindsay. One of them is the Supreme Court will decide whether some businesses can refuse to serve LGBTQ customers on account of free speech. It's a case with major implications for anti-discrimination laws uh, across the country. And they'll decide the fate of President Biden's student debt forgiveness plan. More than 43 million Americans are eligible for relief under that plan. It would cost $400 billion. But is it legal tomorrow, the Supreme Court well, let us know what they think, Lindsay. All right, we'll be bringing you back on for that, ABC's Devin Dwyer. You always have all the latest details. We appreciate it. Thanks, Lindsay. In just a half a century, hip-hop has gone from a counterculture to a driving force behind pop culture. The baggy jeans, flashy jewels, and blinged-out nails that were once shunned by luxury brands are now being embraced. As we continue our Hip Hop at 50 series, our Mona Kosarabdi looks at the impact and evolution of hip-hop fashion. On the runways of fashion's most luxurious houses, a familiar aesthetic. Baggy silhouettes, bomber jackets draped in logos, and athletic sneakers saunter down the catwalk, all marked by an undeniable swagger that's synonymous with hip-hop. 
Everybody wants to be street right now. That's like the hip thing. If you're not street where you're not cool. Today, the symbiosis between hip hop and luxury fashion is understandable, often referenced in song lyrics. Migos, for example, with Versace, Versace, Versace. It's apparent why luxury houses now lean into the admiration from artists, but the embrace from high end brands was painfully slow. When we first started hip hop, and those fashion houses wanted nothing to do with hip hop, they kind of shunned hip hop. Back in the days when we were doing the baggy look and stuff like that, and it was more of like an inner city look, it was called urban. In other words, probably saying black people clothing, right? When hip hop first started and you had iconic looks from like Run DMC and Salt and Peppa and LL Cool J, they really were like the first people on the ground like who really had the music and but the fashion as well. Everyone wanted a Kangol hat because LL Cool J had a Kangol hat. Everyone wanted an Adidas tracksuit because Ryan DC had an Adidas tracksuit. Aaliyah's look today is still known. Every girl knows you wear a baggy bottom and a small crop top. That look is still popular to this day. Oh, you think back to Queen Latifah and what she was serving us when she first came out and with her UNITY look. And then with little Kim coming out and women embracing their sexy and feeling confident to not be afraid to embrace their sexuality. In the late 80s, Run DMC released the record My Adidas, an ode to the three striped Shelto sneaker that they specifically wore without laces. The hit? catching the attention of Adidas executives who all of a sudden noticed a spike in sales, spawning the first partnership of its kind. By the 90s, hip hop was in its golden age, opening up opportunities outside of music. Hip hop needed a, a, a fashion designer to dress those artists when they were coming out, because there was no other fashion houses that paid attention to hip hop. This right here was our first newspaper print design that we did back in 1995. That's Carl Kanai, I universally deemed Kanai. the godfather of urban streetwear. Bam. His eponymous clothing line set the stage for the birth of street fashion. To have every top icon in the 90s wear our brand from, you know, P. Diddy, Tupac, Nas, Aaliyah, Michael Jackson, Biggie Smalls, Pete Rock Seal Smooth. We knew what they wanted. No one else had our fit. No one else had our colors. No one else had the nostalgia and the signature logo that we had. It was just something so different and so unique that it gravitated to the artists and we gravitated back to them. Carl became the blueprint for the many brands that would follow. You had a lot of amazing brands that were birthed out of hip hop from Kooji to FUBU to Sean John to Rock Aware to Baby Fat to Fat Farm. And with the money flowing, rappers were buying it all in abundance. Everybody trying to outdo the next person. It's high school. Oh, yeah. That's what hip hop fashion is. D Rock and Kane from the iconic duo, the Ying Yang Twins, remember how they spent their first paycheck? Clothes, shoes, yeah. jewelry, goals, chains. When a rapper get his first check, he oh, goes yeah. shopping and say, I want that, I want that. Yeah. You go and buy everything you never could buy. That includes the most valuable diamonds that money can buy. Bling, bling. <laughs> Vicky Toback captured its importance in her book, Ice Cold, A Hip Hop Jewelry History. So in the beginning, when it was really still like a community subculture from the Bronx, um, the jewelry was a lot simpler. The jewelry is really, you know, these layered gold chains. And then if you follow the progression, you know, when hip hop steps into its power, when labels start forming, the stakes get bigger and bigger. And so do the chains. It was playful, you know, like a Rubik's Cube or different, just different spins. You saw Gucci Mane with, you know, his Bart Simpson chain, which, you know, I think kind of like blew a lot of people's minds. The first um, introduction for me into jewelry was when I saw 50 Cent wearing his jewelry and his cross on the cover of um, Get Rich or Die Trying. Just a kid in Toronto then, Alex Moss was already becoming a student of the game. Starting his company during the pandemic, at 30 years old, Moss has already designed for some of the biggest names in rap. Drake, ASAP Rocky, Tyler the Creator, Jack Harlow, Chief Keef, Trippy Red, Ken Carson, Destroy Lonely, um, Playboy Cardi. The originality part of it, right? The uniqueness is really important. Exactly. We never make the same thing twice. So I'll never, I won't even do a little iteration of something else. A one of a kind, like this diamond necklace he created for Drake that represents 42 engagement rings. 
This is a custom piece over here. Yes, it is. This one's actually for Geno Smith. He's okay. a quarterback for the Seattle Seahawks. I just recently made it for him. What does something like that cost? Something like this? Yes. Priceless. While giving ASAP Rocky an update on a custom piece Moss had completed for him. The grenade we've been working on is almost ready. Almost. Ready. Almost. Ready. Almost ready. I'm excited. I, I might be more excited than you, bro. We talked to ASAP about how he pushes the boundaries when it comes to his personal style, like swapping diamonds for pearls. I love to play with the lines of, you know. The gender norms. I love exploring that, and that's where I feel most comfortable. You know, doing the things that they say, you know, is unorthodox to you, like, you know, unorthodox or right or wrong or incorrect, politically correct. I, I just don't care. I like to blur the lines, and I'm very daring. And what looks good looks good, right? Now, it's not just the men. The spectacular opulence also attracting the women in hip-hop, who from the beginning were drawn to a similar aesthetic. Back in the day, you know, women were sort of limited in their jewelry choices. It was either, you know, the big earrings or like a dookie rope, just like the guys. But now you see, you know, these powerhouse women like Cardi B, like Ice Spice, like Beyonce. I mean, Beyonce, they all are our Elizabeth Taylors of today. Like they are collecting on a level where they understand generational wealth. They understand quality. The ladies aren't afraid to push the limits with jewelry and definitely not with their nails. So these are the nail station. The it's here in the Bronx we met one of the biggest nail artists in hip hop, the woman behind Cardi B's blinding claws. I'm Jenny Bowie. I'm the queen of bling. Jenny remembers when she did Cardi's nails nearly a decade ago. Woo! She's, she's so exciting about my nail. You know, she... She never had bling before. Artists are drawn to her blinding style, born out of her humble beginnings, fleeing war-torn Cambodia. I come from the poor country. You know, in the poor country, you don't have money to buy the diamond. When you wear my nail, you don't have to wear jewelry. You just get up and go. She loves me, yo. My nail lady loves me. Years later, Cardi, Big Frida, Frida. and other influencers making the trek to the Bronx. Even now, she still comes to the Bronx sometimes. But nobody knows she can because she's in my private room. Yeah. Yeah. Whether it's the Swarovski bling on Cardi B or the elaborate cartoons on Megan The Stallion, each set tells a story. Today, hip hop continues to spawn opportunities for the tastemakers and trendsetters associated with the craft. It's given us the late Virgil Abloh, who left an indelible mark on luxury fashion and paved the way for his successor, Pharrell Williams, who as a newly appointed men's creative director of Louis Vuitton, debuted his first collection in Paris this month. Hip hop is really such a global dominating business. I don't think anyone who was around when hip hop first started saw that coming. 50 years later, the power of the fan base, the dollar and the demand, undeniable. Our thanks to Mona for that. And that is our show for this hour. I'm Lindsay Davis. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. And coming up in the next hour, new developments from the fallout over the Wagner Group's armed revolt, why a top Russian general has reportedly been detained. And we continue our coverage of the Supreme Court's decision to ban the use of affirmative action in college admissions, what it could mean for the future of education. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. This summer, GMA's popping up all across the country, spreading sunshine and summertime fun in the morning. It's GMA's Rise and Shine Summer Tour. Rise and shine. Rise and shine. So, could we be coming to your hometown? This is where the newsmakers come first in the morning to be heard. America's number one morning show. How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? Wherever the story, ABC's Good Morning America is right there. This is ABC News Live.
the crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. You never know what you're going to get on this show. That's all I'm going to tell you. Yes, Whoopi! Is this mic on? Can you hear me out there? Behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely. Always. Absolutely. That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right. They don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasured that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby. It was crazy. Behind the table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is what would you do? Let's go. How are you? Thank you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings, a new podcast from ABC Audio. Listen now, wherever you get your podcasts. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We begin with the bombshell ruling from the Supreme Court on affirmative action that will transform how universities select students in this country and upend a key tool to ensure diversity on campus, which has been in place for nearly 50 years. Tonight, some are rejoicing while others are recoiling, calling the ruling a devastating blow to our education system. Here's what happened at the court today. All six conservative justices ruled the admissions program at Harvard and the University of North Carolina which in part relied on race, violate the Constitution. In his majority opinion, Chief Justice John Roberts said the two schools' admissions policies involve racial stereotyping. The court's three liberal justices dissented, including impassioned words from Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson, who said, quote, deeming race irrelevant in law does not make it so in life. ABC News Live anchor Terry Moran leads us off tonight from the Supreme Court. Tonight, the end of an era in American law and American life. The Supreme Court in a 6-3 to three decision ending affirmative action in higher education as we know it. Chief Justice John Roberts joined by the court's five other conservatives declaring that the admissions policies at Harvard and the University of North Carolina violate the Constitution's guarantee of equal protection of the laws. Roberts writing that the school's affirmative action policies unavoidably employ race in a negative manner and involve racial stereotyping. Under the Constitution, Roberts added, Eliminating racial discrimination means eliminating all of it. But the Chief Justice adding that some consideration of the racial background of an applicant is still lawful in applications essays, for example. Roberts writing, Nothing in this opinion should be construed as prohibiting universities from considering an applicant's discussion of how race affected his or her life, be it through discrimination, inspiration, or otherwise, Roberts wrote. Still, he warned, the student must be treated based on his or her experiences as an individual, not on the basis of race. In a searing dissent, Justice Sonia Sotomayor, joined by the court's two other liberals, declaring, the devastating impact of this decision cannot be overstated. Ignoring racial inequality will not make it disappear. Sotomayor, who has written about how affirmative action programs helped her rise from a Bronx housing project to Princeton University and Yale Law School to the Supreme Court, adding, equal educational opportunity is a prerequisite to achieving racial equality in our nation. 
Justice Clarence Thomas, who also acknowledges benefiting from affirmative action himself, but who has spent more than 30 years on the court trying to end it, striking a deeply personal note in his concurring opinion. While I am painfully aware of the social and economic ravages which have befallen my race and all who suffer discrimination, I hold out enduring hope that this country will live up to its principles, that all men are created equal, are equal citizens, and must be treated equally under the law. The Constitution, Thomas declared, is colorblind. Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson responding in a forceful dissent. With let them eat cake obliviousness, today the majority pulls the ripcord and announces colorblindness for all by legal fiat. But deeming race irrelevant in law does not make it so in life. The court's opinion exempts the U.S. military academies from today's ban on affirmative action in admissions, Chief Justice Roberts saying they present potentially distinct interests. That drew sharp sarcasm from Justice Jackson, who retorted, Racial diversity in higher education is only worth potentially preserving insofar as it might be needed to prepare black Americans and other underrepresented minorities for success in the bunker, not the boardroom. Over the course of 45 years since the court first approved the use of race as one factor in college admissions, affirmative action has reshaped life and learning on American campuses. Today, students were reckoning with what the Supreme Court has done. Alex Shea, who will go to Brown University this fall, telling us... It does make me feel a little bit uncomfortable knowing that in that admissions office, when they were deciding whether they were going to accept me, reject me, that they might have been considering my race. Because I, I think that that's not something that I can control or that anyone can control. And I think that it's unfair to judge someone based on that. And Duke University student Bumi Omaswari. My identity has to be my race. The, you know, the struggles that I've gone through, the trauma I've gone through as an African-American woman in the United States. If I were applying to college today, I would have to write about those traumas in my Common Up essay. I would have to write about those traumas and those very hard experiences for admissions officers to accept the overwhelming truth that we all know, which is that it is hard to be a black person in America. And I don't think that's fair. Our thanks to Terry for that. President Biden responded to today's decision, speaking at the White House to say that discrimination still exists and today's decision does not change that and adding that, quote, this is not a normal court. Here's ABC's chief White House correspondent, Mary Bruce. President Biden blasting the Supreme Court, saying he strongly disagrees with today's decision. The truth is, we all know it, discrimination still exists in America. Discrimination still exists in America. Discrimination still exists in America. Today's decision does not change that. In a statement, former President Obama saying affirmative action allowed generations of students like Michelle and me to prove we belonged. Now it's up to all of us to give young people the opportunities they deserve. Michelle Obama insisting the policy helped offer new ladders of opportunity for those who throughout our history have too often been denied a chance to show how fast they can climb. Adding my heart breaks for any young person out there who's wondering what their future holds. But former President Trump, who appointed three Supreme Court justices and is currently leading the pack in the Republican primary, is now claiming credit for today's ruling, declaring this is a great day for America. People with extraordinary ability and everything else necessary for success, including future greatness for our country, are finally being rewarded. With conservatives in the court now holding a 6-3 supermajority, President Biden asked today if this is a rogue court. Is this a rogue court? This is not a normal court. Mary Bruce joins us now. Mary, President Biden is urging colleges to continue pushing for diversity in admissions, but is there anything more that his administration can do? Well, Lindsay, the president says that this decision cannot be the last word on this, but there really is only so much that the president can do here. What he can do is make this a central issue in the upcoming election to try and mobilize voters around this, using the court as an example of why elections really do have consequences. Lindsay. All right, Mary Bruce for us. Thanks so much, Mary. Thank you. And I want to bring in Rachel Scott, who's covering the race for the White House for us. Republican candidates Nikki Haley and Tim Scott have spoken about their background in race. Uh, Rachel, what were their reactions today? 
Yeah, even Republican candidates like Tim Scott and Nikki Haley, who have made overcoming adversity a central part of their campaign message, are making it clear that they do support this ruling from the Supreme Court. So former U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley, who introduced herself on the campaign trail as the daughter of immigrants, says that this decision ensures that every student, regardless of background, can reach the American dream. Senator Tim Scott of South Carolina, he often talks about his own rise out of poverty. He calls this good news. He says that it should be celebrated across the country. And that praise is rippling throughout the entire Republican field, Lindsay. Rachel Scott, our thanks to you. And let's bring in ABC News legal contributor Asha Rangappa. Thank you so much for your time and joining us tonight. I understand that you think that this ruling is a lot more narrow than many people may think. I explain what you mean by that. Yes. Well, in reading it, I was expecting, for example, that the court might just completely bar any discussion or mention or consideration of race in the admissions process. You can imagine, for example, um, students not even being able to talk about it in their applications because then that could become a subjective consideration. Justice Kagan in her dissent says that they're putting lipstick on a pig. But I, what they're trying to do is saying that race cannot be a proxy for experience. In other words, race standing alone cannot contribute to a school's diversity. However, if a student articulates how race has impacted their experience and perspective, that at the individual review uh, part of the admissions process can be taken into account. I think the bigger issue here is that a school cannot take into account its overall racial composition as it's making its admissions decisions. You know, I guess I'm asking you really to look at a crystal ball here, and that's that's unfair in this scenario. But do you think, though, even as it stands right now, that this might lead to less diverse campuses across the country? I think it's hard to say. Um, it will really depend on how schools implement this process. Um, I can imagine, for example, more applications offering supplemental essays or diversity essays, inviting students to discuss uh, aspects of their background or identity that they think might be relevant to their application. Many schools already do this, um, actually. But I think we'll see more of that. This will probably impact large schools more than small schools because to get to uh, some of these diversity interests based on race, they're going to have to really dive into these individual characteristics. Did anything about the majority opinion surprise you? I do think that it was interesting that, you know, they were looking at this constitutional test of strict scrutiny. This is um, a, a test that's used when there's a race-based classification to determine whether the method that is being used um, is narrowly tailored to a compelling government interest. And they do acknowledge implicitly that diversity can be an interest. What they disagree with is how you measure diversity. They say that you can't really measure it in any concrete way, which means that you know, the types of programs that UNC and Harvard had, um, there's no meaningful way to review whether they're working or whether there can ever be an endpoint. And what about the fact that the Supreme Court had a carve out for military academies and, and, and they are exempt for, for what reason? Well, they were not a party to this suit. And that that was surprising to me because what they are suggesting is that that test that I just mentioned, when racial classifications um, are narrowly tailored to a compelling government interest, that the government interest in the military academy for uh, you know promoting our uh, leadership corps in the military, our national security interests, that there may actually be compelling reasons uh, to consider race as those academies are making admissions decisions that are distinct from the ones at general univers at, you know, universities and colleges across the country. Um, they don't articulate what those could be. They just sort of leave that to the side um, as something that they're not going to consider. Asha Rangappa, we so appreciate your insight on this matter. Appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you.
Now to the air quality and heat alerts for about 230 million Americans right at the beginning of the July 4th holiday weekend. The haze from Canadian wildfires reached New York City once again. In Philadelphia, a code red is in effect. And Washington, D.C. now has the worst air among the world's major cities. And tonight, that record heat in the south is spreading north and east after taking at least 14 lives in Texas and Louisiana. Here's ABC's Alex Perez. Tonight, major city skylines disappearing into a shroud of smoke from those unending Canadian wildfires. This time lapse showing what Cleveland looked like this morning. This smoke is just making me sick. Columbus, Ohio, recording its worst air reading ever, 244 on that scale of 1 to 500 at 7 a.m. The air quality index much higher. In Pittsburgh, the Pirates delaying today's game against the San Diego Padres. Detroit and Washington, D.C. taking the top spots for the worst air quality in the world. Officials in D.C. and Philadelphia issuing a code red. It makes me feel nauseous, and I can feel the particles in the air. Last night, I even felt my eyes were watering. The entire state of New York is under hazardous conditions with respect to our air quality. New York's governor announcing a plan to send text alerts to residents' phones when air quality is dangerous. Meanwhile, that record-breaking high-pressure heat dome parked over much of the south is spreading from Texas to Florida. At least 14 deaths confirmed in Texas and Louisiana. A delivery driver nearly collapsing on a front porch in Cypress, Texas. Amazon says they reached out to the driver after seeing this, and the driver is okay. That heat fueling these fires burning near Phoenix and even helping spawn severe weather. These powerful storms south of Chicago and this massive tornado overnight in Nebraska. Thanks to Alex for that. A former sheriff's deputy was acquitted on all charges for his alleged failure to act during the Parkland school massacre. Scott Peterson wept in a Florida courtroom as the verdict was read, while the family members of some of the victims shook their heads in disbelief. Peterson was the school's resource officer and stayed outside of the building while the shooting took place. He had faced 11 counts, including child neglect and culpable negligence. 17 people were killed that day at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. So much more to get to tonight coming up. It's an action-packed series covering part of history many have never heard of. And tonight, streamlined actor Andrew Koji joins us to talk about Warrior and the connection it has to the legendary Bruce Lee. But next, clashes between police and protest as hundreds in Paris demonstrate following the fatal shooting of a teen by a police officer. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charles from Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's Bring how you start your, your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> How cute. Yeah. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. I'm Devin Dwyer reporting from Burlington, Vermont. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're watching ABC News Live.
Welcome back, everyone. We're tracking several headlines around the world. More than 100 people have already been arrested tonight as violent anti-police protests continue to escalate in France. Demonstrators have set fire to buildings and cars. They're calling for accountability after authorities fatally shot a 17-year-old in a suburb of Paris as he allegedly sped away from police in his car. The officer involved is now in custody. The top Russian general, who had been in conversations with the leader of the Wagner Group before the mutiny had been has been detained, according to a U.S. official. Sergei Sorovikin's exact whereabouts have been unknown following the Wagner Group's weekend rebellion that came within 100 miles of Moscow. And many South Koreans just got two years younger. Overnight, officials there are retiring an outdated age-counting method that makes people a year or two older than they really are, recognizing a baby as one year old at birth and adding another year when the calendar hits January 31st. The country is looking to standardize international ages based on the passing of birthdays. Time tonight for the latest in our series, Streamlined, where we bring you some of the biggest films and TV series hitting screens worldwide. Speaking with some of the actors and creators behind them, and tonight we go to the late 1800s in San Francisco, where gang wars are overtaking Chinatown, and one man is caught in the middle as the government cracks down on the Chinese underground and a community trying to create their American dream. Let's take a look at Warrior. You guys seem to have wandered off Longzi territory. Walk away. Well, you escalated that pretty fast. Usually there's a little more repartee. And we are joined now by Andrew Koji to talk about the return of the third season of Warrior on Max. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, Lindsay. Thank so you. as we clearly saw just there in that clip, this is an action-packed uh, show based on uh, an era that a lot of people really don't know a lot about. What was that like for you to kind of dig into this history and bring it to life? Yeah, there's a lot of things that uh, opens your eyes to, yeah, the period of history in 1878. Um, or the uh, racial tension that was going on in in in, uh, in uh, Chinatown, San Francisco, based on the writings of Bruce Lee that he, he uh, um, that he wrote and developed by Jonathan Tropper and and, and, the, and the team. Um, yes, yeah, it's it's, it's uh, hopefully a fun and entertain, entertaining show, but at the same time, uh, something yeah, telling about a period of history that not many people know about. Yeah. It's, uh, and you talk about, you know, Bruce Lee wrote and developed this idea. Is it kind of surreal to be working on and bringing one of his projects to life? Yeah, that's always been a strange thing. I never thought that I would be doing it. Um, but, yeah, it's the way it's all come about. I mean, Bruce Lee, I was about to quit, up, uh, quit uh, give up acting. And uh, it's almost like Bruce Lee, the spirit of Bruce Lee himself, mm. picked me back up and kind of just said, keep going. Um, and with a, a show like this, you know, I think it's, uh, yeah, it's kind of an honor to be part of. Why are you going to quit acting? It's, uh, it's a tough industry, this, mm, isn't it? It you is. Know? It can be a challenge, especially being, uh, when I started 15 years ago, being an ethnic minority in, in London, uh, there weren't many opportunities. So this is a, this kind of show, uh, did, this worry didn't exist back then, so. And your character is a martial arts prodigy, prodigy who leaves China to San Francisco in, in search of his sister. How would you describe him? Well, season one, he's a bit of a hothead, and he comes in, thinks he can uh, take on everyone, and he basically goes on a journey of getting humbled. Um, he, I mean, he's very sharp and he's very um, quick-witted, a bit arrogant, but then I think um, throughout the series it kind of explores what it means to be a warrior, what it means to be a fighter, what it means to to have something to fight for and stand for. And I think that's what uh, the kind of the character of Assam is supposed to, uh, you know, encapsulate. After season two, there was a little bit of unfinished business. What would you say that we're gonna learn from your character now from Assam in, in this third season? I think you're gonna see uh, sides of characters that know, uh, that have yet to be seen yet. I think we've got our strongest season yet, I think. Mm. I think for Bruce's legacy, for for um, for the Asian representation, and for the period of history that's trying to tell in this kind of fun, I don't think there's any action scenes like it in in, in TV, and I think in the uh, Hollywood film industry is, uh, 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 as well. It kind of stands up to that to those things. But what we learn about the characters, we'll see a different side to him. We'll see him go through different things and kind of be challenged. He's going to decide this season. He's going to decide about what he's going to do uh, going forward. 
Hey, hey, talk about it. We see how just action packed all of this is. You actually have a background in martial arts. What did it take for you to train and actually prepare for this role? Yeah, uh, yeah, like the, <laughs> I got my ass kicked basically uh. by all these, these, these all these amazing uh, uh, instructors this career, uh, in, uh, this training in Korea. That's pretty uh, impressive stuff. Yeah, Look I'm, at you. Oh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> I'm, you know, an actor who's having to pick it back up for, for the show. Um, but you know, I learn, I can only learn a fraction of really what it takes to dedicate your whole life to martial art. I can still. I'll still hold my own against a lot of people, but <laughs> uh, you learn a lot, you learn a lot, you learn, but then you also learn humility as well yeah. because you get your ass kicked on the <laughs> regular basis. Andrew Koji, really appreciate Thank you coming you. on uh, on the show and want to let our viewers know that you can stream Warrior beginning today on Max. And still to come, five and fabulous. Meet the mini model turning heads and making her dreams come true. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings, a new podcast from ABC Audio. Listen now, wherever you get your podcasts. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. From America's number one news comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, here we go, you ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is what would you do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching? Watching Saturdays on ABC News Live. What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. She is fierce, fabulous, and only five. An ambitious little girl in Troy, Michigan, is striking a pose on the runway and is getting some big attention for her modeling work. Reporter Alexandra Bahu from our partner station WXYZ has tonight's local lowdown. In many ways, Amia Brock is like any typical five-year-old. I love to play outside on the trampoline. But she's also got that presence. I call her Mimi the top model. Amia's grandmother, Lisa Hicks, says her granddaughter caught the modeling bug at just four years old. No practice, no teaching. Mimi got on that runway and stole the show. We were so proud. So we saw at that time that she was a natural. And from there, someone booked her from that show, and it's been a snowball effect ever since. She has been invited to New York Fashion Week. She's been invited to Milan. She's been invited to Chicago. She was invited to the Washington Fashion Week. For Amia, performing, especially on the runway, is an art she seems to already have down to a science. So I walk first, turn around, and then pose, 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 and then turn back around. When I see my little grandbaby on the walkway, it's just like, oh my God. Even if we're in the audience, Mimi is so focused on what she's doing. If I be, Mimi, she will not even look at me. What do I need to work on? So you need to work on stop like bouncing. Oh, stop bouncing, okay, good, good. Like you, uh, like you know how you normal walk? Yep. But, but walk like slow or fast? Slowly, okay. But pose. pose. So while she may be little, she's not shying away from those big career dreams. I want to be a top model. I want to be everything. Amia has it. I think she said walk, walk, turn around, pose. 
our thanks for that. And Amia, uh, we're looking forward to that bright future ahead. Thanks so much for streaming with us tonight. I'm Lindsay Davis. ABC News Live is here for you all night with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on Hulu, Roku, the ABC News app, and of course, on abcnews.com. Have a great night. This is ABC News Live. The crush of family.